So um, I'm very glad you you accepted the invitation and you're joining uh, today. Uh, I've been uh, looking forward to talking to you for, for so long. Uh, I personally have known of your work for so many years, uh, I think ever since the project with the, for the BBC. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was lucky to, to uh, put my hand on a copy of your published uh, PhD study, um, Arabic type making in the machine age. And I, it, it, it really struck me by surprise for so many reasons. Um, between fine, like between finally having my hand on on, on uh, literature that that carries this much information, <laughs> this <laughs> much <laughs> of uh, archiving of 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 the history of type and the the kind of information it's holding as well, that mm-hmm. that was very enriching to be able to see this kind of uh, communications and, and and messages between colleagues. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't want to I don't want to uh, spoil that much and I want to leave much more of the ground for you but um, there is so many I would like to to ask or, or, or to look at as a starting point sure. for, for our conversation because f- first of all you mentioned um, I think it's it's I'm not sure if it was in an article or in the abstract, but uh, about the value of research informed design process and mm-hmm. how it, uh, it would enrich um, the, 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 the sense of responsibility for the designer. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I, I, want to, I, w- I would love to hear more uh, about this from you. Uh, for myself and for any other designers joining us today. Okay. Well, first of all, let me let me reciprocate and uh, say thank you very much for for having me. It it means a lot to be um, invited to this forum, and um, I'm yeah I'm I'm really glad that we can have this conversation here today. Um, so, if if we're talking about research and um, research-based design processes. Uh, I, guess, I guess a lot of what I'm doing is, is informed by, by an approach that has been, mm, let's say, refined at, at the Department of Reading, um, where I've done my master's and my PhD and where I'm currently uh, pursuing a research project. Um, so I'm by no means, um, like standing out this is this is something that is turning into a bit of a a school almost of of approaching approaching design and and i'm i'm following in in the footsteps of of many other um researcher slash designers Uh, fiona ross is a a prominent example that, that immediately strikes me it comes to mind and um yeah and so what i'm maybe I'll just say a few words about the thing that I'm currently doing. Um, Because uh, as as we speak, I'm in the in the last phase of a research project that I'm pursuing at the department of Reading again. Um, It's a it's a project that was funded by a Horizon 2020 uh, funding scheme um, by the by the uh, European Commission. And it's it runs under the title uh, typo Arabic. And it's when when I designed the, the the project, it was very much conceived to to do just that, to use historical research to inform contemporary practice, and that was informed by my by my experience in in this particular field, because it's been now almost twenty years that I've been exploring and learning about and studying and um, eventually writing and teaching on the subject um, and practicing, not to forget. And and one of the recurring things is that there are so few accessible published sources that can help 
the the student, the novice, the the beginner in that who, for whatever reason, approaches the subject to to find to find his bearings to 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 get a a, a starting point, and um, the, the the current project is conceived specifically with a perspective on typography rather than type design, even though. I've worked mainly in type design, but I've also done typography. And I found that in, in recent years, this discourse about type design has been quite rich and there, there are many voices and um, there is, yeah, there are opinions and schools of thought and whatnot. But surprisingly few people talk about how type is used. Type design seems to be, have taken over. And as nice as the interest in type design is, as lacking is any kind of profound discussion about how type is actually used. And in my humble opinion, that ought to come before. And, and so when I conceived this current research project, I wanted to single out typography and leave type design as far as possible at the side. And um, where do you start to learn about Arabic typography, especially as somebody who is not native and somebody who comes to it from the outside? Because I'm an outsider from background and, and from my language capabilities. And um, so I looked at historical practice because this is something that is also um, quite established in, in, in the Western design profession that people go back to the sources, go back to the 16th century even and study how the masters of the past have practiced our trade. And I asked myself, who are the masters of the past for Arabic typography? Uh, and uh, there are not few, many publications that would give you good answers to these kind of questions. And why would they be considered masters? What, what made their work exemplary? Why are they standing out as, exemplar, as, as, as examples to follow? Um, so with all these questions in mind, um, I, I identified the second half of the 19th century as a key moment. Um, bear with me one second. Um, a key moment because that is when in the Middle East, mainly in, in Beirut, in, in Cairo and in Istanbul, uh, typography was taken up for the first time and was taken up by local craftspeople who made their own type and who began setting their own texts, their own typography uh, in Turkish, in Persian, in Arabic, and they turned it into a success. And they turned it into a success 500 years, 400 years, um, after it had been introduced as a, as a technology. It had been known. People knew that stuff existed, but it was not a success. Everything that any European printer tried to produce in terms of Arabic typography was either ignored or laughed at by, by the, the, the local native readership. And so my thinking was that if in this particular time and, and, and place, people were able to turn what has been 400 years of, I don't care, into a print revolution, they must have done a whole lot right. They must have done something really spot on. And so I went back to look at how they practiced our trade and tried to learn from their, from their ways of doing things. And to that end, I, I looked at, um, I looked at um, second half of the 19th century uh, printed books, primarily books from these three locales and um, tried to analyze them, tried to distill patterns, uh, measure things, count how many characters are to align um, in order to get a sense of parameters that were considered good or maybe ideal by those people who, for the first time, made Arabic typography a success. And um, 
I'm now in the in the in the in the final phase of this project, and um, I, I'm very happy to say that we're currently working on a on a on a publication that will summarize some of these some of these findings. And I have the privilege and pleasure to work with um, with a few very esteemed uh, colleagues who have all contributed. Um, chapters or essays on, on their specific expertise. Um, there is Emanuela Conidi, who has um, also done her PhD just a few years ago. Um, there is uh, Borna Izapana, who has just uh, finished last year um, with a specific perspective on, on the history of Iranian or Iranian typography. And Onur Yazidchigil, who, um, who worked specifically on Ottoman, on Ottoman um, foundry type. And all of this come together in a book that kind of seeks to do exactly that, bring research together with practice. So there are, will be our four essays that are all looking at the historical aspect of, of Arabic type making and typography. And then there will be a, a practical guide part that kind of looks at what was done in the past and tries to learn from, learn key lessons and, and, and articulate let's say the, the fundamentals that you ought to know when you start to engage with Arabic typography. Um, okay, but I've just spoken a lot, so maybe I, you want to chime in here. No, 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 definitely. I would love to hear more. Um, and, it's, it, it, and it's super nice to hear that you're working on this project because while you clearly differentiate the focus that it's on typography and on the use of type and not necessarily on the making of type for this project, but after all, and this is something we discussed uh, with Gary uh, last time, that both will be like both discussions discussions are enriching and needed for the discipline itself, like for for the study of the science of of anything related to type in general. So definitely. We need more findings in, in that field. We need more research and more uh, literature to get back to as a resource of studying that. Um, but like, feel free to, to uh, if, if I dive in too much into typography and you want to pull it back toward, uh, into type design and you want to pull it back to the use of it, just feel free to do this. Oh, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very comfortable to talk about yeah, it either. Because you mentioned that you noticed that there's like a revolution of print and kind of mastering of the use of type in the in the second half of 19th century. Mm -hmm. And one thing I'm not like one thing in, in, in my own research and my own uh, looking for answers is I tried to look at what did this delay that happened of, of 400 years uh close to the development of of the arabic type um not only technically but also to the to the evolution of the letter forms itself to the evolution mm -hmm. of the shapes the letter forms started to take um because while maybe the latin had a certain line of, of development when it came to arabic it was sudden that in the 19th century that yeah, we need to oversimplify now. Like this is not working and we need to simplify the Arabic form, the Arabic letter forms to work within this technology that, that we have in hand. Mm -hmm. And when I look on the early prints in, in Arabic, of Arabic in, in Europe, um, you say that it was laughed at, and, and this is also something that I came across, but in the same time, when I look at it now, it can also look a little bit like some of the quirky contemporary typefaces, especially the 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 the, the Quran that was printed in Germany. Mm -hmm. it, it it has some kind of a quirkiness that can look a little bit like a contemporary typeface that was released like last month or something. Yeah. yeah. So to what extent do you feel that this um, this delay? has affected the development of the sh of, of the evolution of the Arabic letter forms itself. Right. Um, I would be, I'd be cautious to speak of a delay because I think the way it must have been perceived was that 
typography simply was not needed. I don't think it was, I don't think we can talk about a delay when in fact, what appears to me, people in the Middle East made a conscious decision that this technology was no good for them the way it was done. Because what came from Europe was, was onerous to produce. It was very slow. It was very expensive. Um, and they had none of the required um, skills in the region. Um, and then the, the, the resulting products were just not convincing. They, they had nothing to do with the, with the manuscript culture that was prevalent. So I don't think there was a delay, but there was just a realization that, well, this stuff is of no use to us at this point. Whereas when local craftspeople used their sensibilities to, to the forms, to make their own type, they turned it into a success and, they, and it was realized that, well, hey, if typography, if Arabic typography can look like that, it is a very interesting prospect and we, of course, will take it up and use it. Um, and of course, the, the, the later adoption, if we don't call it a, a, a delay, um, means that we have a, a much more, a much shorter history of Arabic typography as practiced as a mass medium. Um, and also it means that especially now in the last 30 years, this development or the tr an attempt to catch up with 500 years of printing history has been compressed into just a few just a few decades. And, and of course, that is this rapid, this rapid um, catching up is, it entails some, some shortcuts. Because if you, if you look at the evolution of, of European type forms, they very gradually changed. It took decades and it took hundreds of years for the modern star to evolve and for sans serif to be a thing that could be used, that could be, um, that was accepted. Um, Arabic typography didn't have that time, but now everybody assumes and expects that there is the exact equivalent. And I think that's mainly a, a problem of expectation. And, and this expectation, I believe, is fueled by a lack of understanding that one formal repertoire is the result of 500 years. And you cannot just assume that in 150 years, you get exactly a matching result and everything can be just, um, yeah, matching in, in every sense of the word. Um, so uh, a lot of this has of course to do with economic um, um, needs and, and, and wishes. It's, it's driven, the design language is very much driven by international design language that is very much driven by a Western capitalism. Um, and of course, then you get a reaction in the sense of a formal uh, trying to cater to this need. Um, and well, that's not that's not going to be changed you cannot you cannot you cannot undo that but what you can try to 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 achieve is to inform how things are done and on on what basis people make decisions because most of the time um decisions are just they are they don't necessarily happen as a best practice, but they happen because of external circumstances that are not that are not designed or driven by best practice um, aspirations, but much more short term and um, limited um, goals. You want you want to sell a certain thing within a certain time frame 
to whoever who beat your superior or um, to the board of to the board who decides about the design language of the company, whatnot. And no one has the time to actually learn about the subject. And I think it's at that point that uh, a tremendous responsibility comes to the designers who make the proposals in the first place. And it's, it's at that level that in design informed by research can actually make a difference. I, I definitely agree with this. And maybe, maybe the word delay like maybe a better word can be there to be used to describe that kind of a pressure that um, at a certain point of time, you feel that Arabic script went through to be able to keep up with this, like uh, between mass, mass production needs and a digital era and suddenly not only that you have a lot of area to cover but you're also going to be present alongside other scripts you're going to be there alongside the latin uh you're going to definitely be compared to it so you, at, at this point you can't help but see it as an actual delay away from the choice that I, yeah definitely the choice will like readers and makers made the choice to stick to the manuscript copyist work and uh it was a popular choice to, to, till a certain point of time till they really needed to keep up with this modernization happening around them mm -hmm. coming from the west and and uh and and wanting to keep up with it and, and everything but again to get to the last thing you mentioned about the responsibility of the designer in, in mm -hmm. informing this uh, about this pro this process and informing mm -hmm. that the right choices that needs to be done or maybe the more proper choices culturally mm -hmm. even to be to be uh, went after and this is a thing where where the lack is now harder that while you see that there is a lot of enrichment and changes happening in the industry of type design Definitely that, that, that is happening. We have more native designers. The technology itself of making Arabic type is more accessible than it was 15 years ago or even mm -hmm. 20 years ago or 10 years ago. That, that's definitely. But when it comes to the, 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 the literature and to the accessibility to the history even, yep. this, is, this is where the lack is, is, is in my opinion, is happening. Mm -hmm. Like for me, while checking your your um, your your literature, the first thing that strikes me is, or the first like comment that went in my head: How the hell did he get his hand on all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Like, because not only the type of documents that you were able to put your hand on, the communications, all these like information that yeah. for me, as someone who is coming from Cairo and before coming to this master's, I did not even have a BA. Like this is my first academic experience. Mm -hmm. And I've been working as a designer already for 15 years. Sure. And, but still like when I, when I looked at this, I was surprised by how were you able to find this? How were you able to put your hand on it? Yeah. While in the same time, you, I'm sure you know that most of the native Arabic script writers, readers, designers, and end users, they would not have that kind of accessibility between manuscripts and archives being distributed around the world in countries that needs a lot of visas, a lot of accessibility that is not easy to be offered to people from this region. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I want to know how did you get your hand on the, all this <laughs> right. all this archives? Yeah. yeah. Uh Yes, I, I think I think the being aware of what kind of sources you can access will definitely will will frame your entire research. So any kind of research that I have undertaken set out by identifying what sources there are and what I can access in sense of having a look, in the sense of making sense of them. 
um, and and yeah, how, what can I what can I use to inform to, to what can I search in my research? Um, and in, 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 the, in the case of my PhD, it was a very, a very clear, a very clear um, scenario because there I, the, the University of Reading held or holds um, a significant amount of, of, of files from the, from the, from the Linotype uh, company, <coughs> companies, the various companies. Um, and and they have they have actively put like collected them from from different places and um, and they have driven an active research program for students to engage with that collection. Collections based research is the thing that the department does. Um, and in the course of the research, I discovered other archives um, that. Kind of complemented what I what I had in reading, so I could travel to to Washington to the Smithsonian um, institution that holds a significant amount of of archives from the um, American Linotype uh, branch, and um, and also complemented it by looking at the archives of the Photon uh, company in in France or Lumitype uh, as it was called in France, and. Of course, it's it was an absolute treasure trove to have access to this material. At the same time, it is it is also just one particular perspective. It is the perspective of of Western, of European and North American um, manufacturers of equipment and and type, and to tell the story from that particular perspective, this material was sensational but I would think and hope uh, that there would be material from the users from the printers from government presses uh, from newspapers that all operated in throughout the Middle East and North Africa India you name it um, and these are archives if they exist, that would potentially be much more accessible to someone who is native and local to these places. So for example, I, I know without having been there myself that the archives um, of, of the Bulak press in, in Cairo are exceedingly difficult to access, especially so for foreigners. So there is a, a flip side. I, if it would be equally interesting if research was conducted with archives that are not in the West, but that are in, let's say, Cairo to start with. Um, and I think that could tell yet another story that may not even be just a mirror, but it may actually tell different aspects that, are, that you cannot tell with the material that is found in in the in the archives of the of the Western commercial companies, uh, for example, in in recent years um, there has been some 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 have been some very interesting findings from the from the Ottoman archives. So they are fairly accessible to researchers who are familiar with uh, Ottoman Turkish, um, and there are not all that many because because of the script reform you have to be able to read arabic and understand turkish so yeah. um that's not it's not a given and um there you can find um potentially absolutely enlightening stuff that no one has heard about i don't know because i don't have access to those and it would be fabulous to have more research in, on the on this material uh one one caveat, one, one problem is that we, at least for my, I don't know how much is preserved. Um, we know we have the punches, um, we have punches from the 16th century for, for European type. We have matrices, we have even cast type, but there's hardly anything has been found in, in terms of Arabic type. And even though it's much younger, even from the 19th century, 
we haven't found much. Um, but yeah, there is hope and maybe maybe researchers that work with these local archives are, are going to unearth very different material. Yeah, it's definitely like a kind of a sad fact, like from the history, like the, the black press uh, or any archive in Egypt, particularly the accessibility of it is almost impo impossible. Um, I myself been like trying to access, like to find an actual copy of um, that the Nastali type made mm -hmm. by Zinklaq al Kharasani for the Bulat Press. Mm -hmm. And of course, I cannot put my hand on anything from the archive of the Bulat Press itself. And very, very recently, me and Khalid were able to acquire like a copy of a book that is like a hundred and 30 years old and we have to pay for it that much to be able to have like some kind of a personal collection that you can later on use uh, yeah. for such a study so and I'm aware also that the metrics and the, the, the pieces from the, the black breast they were all sold as scrap like uh, mm -hmm. many years ago so but but the thing is Without going to into the political why this happened and why this this is the, the situation of archives in Egypt and Lebanon, maybe it's similar. Um, but if anything, that this for me makes the importance of making work and research uh, like yours or in general the work that, for example, comes out of reading, for it to be more accessible. Mm -hmm. I think that like the status quo of, of, of these, of, of the lack of archiving or making it accessible makes the need for this literature to be accessible even more important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, yeah. And, and this is not something that I'm, I'm not throwing the responsibility on you, of course. Like in, in my head, as I look at it, I feel like there is definitely a missing link between the work researchers like yourself do, like Borna, like Fiona do at Reading and in many other places, mm -hmm. and making that research accessible to the designers because the lack of this link is, mm -hmm. first of all, only making space for shortcoming research that will be mostly a little bit cheaper in price and easier to access kind of. Mm -hmm. But then when you get it, you look at it, you feel like you're either misinformed or getting nothing, absolutely nothing. And you just paid 40 euros for like a, a catalog that has really nothing even in it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'm trying to think of, what is it that needs to be done here? Mm -hmm. Like, I understand that there is a publishing house that needs, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about the, the economy of publishing houses in Europe. Mm -hmm. But for me, a study that is this important to be marketed for that price mark, mm -hmm. it says that something is wrong. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to, to um, defend... Uh prices of yeah, no, academic no. publishers I, I, because it's I just not... I just want to think with you publicly on what is it that is missing there what yeah. what is needs to be done for all this knowledge and research and work that is being produced in the academia and you're finishing it and moving it to, on to the next one yeah. while the designers and, and 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 users who are there to be informed and and feed on this information are kind of unable to access it yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely the case that the two worlds have not been talking very well to each other. That design and and academia, they know little from each other, um, especially so uh, academics uh, know precious little about design. And in that is one of my um, strong misgivings that many historians of 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 print and uh, in the Middle East, especially, they have never learned or cared much to investigate the material qualities of the things that they're talking about. And, and I think there's an important role for people who have been more trained more in, 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 let's say, to look at stuff, trained to 
to engage and describe, have the language to describe visual things. And this is very much a role that I'm trying to play. Um, on the app, I can, I can say that um, there, are, there is a, definitely a strong tendency to have more open access publications. Like the, the research project that I'm currently working on has the requirement that any kind of journal articles, any kind of peer reviewed publications need to be published in open access. And um, that still remains in a fairly academic context. Uh, but also the book now with, uh, with the, the forthcoming publication, I have, because of this issue, not wanted to go with an academic publisher, but have sought an, um, a so-called design publisher, so, uh, a publisher who, that has a, a track record in our field and is, is in the right bookshops and is well connected to be picked up by, by the design community. Um, and I think it's, it's fairly novel in that, that there is research that has a background in, in, in scholarly academic research being published in that context. And there the price tag will be the price tag that you expect from a design book around the 40, 40 euro um, uh, mark. And I hope that, that makes a difference. Having said that, because uh, my, my first book was with Brill, even though it is very expensive, but because it has been published with them, it can be found in, I think, 600 plus research libraries around the world. That is a fair number if you think, even if just three people will ever borrow them, that's cons a considerable reach that you may not even get with individual personal copies of books. So having said that, I, I don't have any word, I don't have anything to say about the actual price policy. I can say that I think there is a, there is value in it being accessible in libraries and that there is a, 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 a wider accessibility that may not be the same as owning a copy, but nonetheless, it may be quite significant. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, yes. And and yeah, it's it's also a relief to know that your your next uh, book would be within <laughs> within an approachable price range. Yeah, yeah, I'm very pleased about that too. Yeah, yeah, I'm very pleased about that too. And um, well, and I'm also happy to say that I just use this uh, occasion to to plug an event that we're in the process of making. Um, Onur Yazicigil, I think he's also in the audience. Um, yes, nice. he's That's been nice. he's been really busy working on a on a book launch, and and I'm very happy to say that we're planning a book launch in in Istanbul that he has kind of single handedly um, organized, and um, it's going to be this autumn, probably at the end of October, beginning of uh, November. There will be a one day mini conference with speakers, um, maybe some little exhibit uh, on the subject of Arabic typography and, and the relationship of Arabic writing culture and, and print. And um, yeah, I hope that some of the audience today may also come to Istanbul. I would definitely do that. I, I haven't seen Unur also since uh, Istanbul type that uh, 2016. So. There you go. Finally, this is happening after Corona, so I'll definitely love to, to meet you guys there. Yeah. Um, we have one question from one of the audience. I would like to read it. One question I've had about the revolution of print that you have mentioned is that there seems to be an acceleration from zero to... What's the account? I don't know if it's a big deal. Sorry, let me... Someone is... Okay. Uh, is that there seems to be an acceleration from zero to 100 very quickly from a practical perspective. When you refer, refer to shortcuts, were there any shortcuts in production of type and specifically buncher, uh, bunches and metrics that facilitated this? For example, it seems that to produce a full set of hundreds of sorts one could do this more quickly with a technique using reusable component punches to produce metrics rather than crafting a separate 
bunch for each sword separately. Is there any evidence of this? That's a very technical, very uh, detailed yeah. question. <laughs> um, uh, yes, of course, there's there's evidence of of um, of, for example, um, using having having the dots separated from the from the rasm, um, or casting everything together with all potential dot configurations, and then for the composer to have to file off what he didn't need. So yes, there were in every kind of technology type makers always sought to economize and make it more efficient. So yes, definitely there have been numerous um, attempts to 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 simplify it and and i think this is this has even become very very deliberate and articulate in in um well what i describe in in, in my in my phd research my book uh, arabic type making machine age um, how for the sake of constraints imposed by machinery uh, arabic type was simply really simplified and uh, the character set was limited the, the variations of 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 character of of letter forms were just all thrown out um and all of that all of those were shortcuts that fundamentally changed how arabic text looked when set with with um with mechanical composition yeah, and to also to add to the, uh, to the answer of this question, there is one book that I came across. It's called The History of, Bula, uh, of the Bula Bruce, uh by Abu Al-Futuh Radwan. Mm -hmm. It's in Arabic. I'm not sure if there is an English copy not that, I know uh, that is available for it. Mm -hmm. But I remember that he mentioned also the work on uh, minimizing the number of sets uh later in and in a point of history when they wanted to simplify the version that uh Zinklech Rasani produced mm -hmm. and he was mentioning a little bit uh on that in this book sadly it's not I, I'm, I didn't come across it being in English uh but it's it's a, a very wonderful beast yeah it's, it's one of the standard studies on on the Bullock press yeah and um, we are welcoming any questions from the audience. Yeah, I don't know. Was was that a was that enough of an answer to to this? So. And, and until we get any further questions from the from from the audience, if they have any further, um, I'm I'm trying like if if we are gonna speculate words how do we see the development of the arabic script like mm -hmm. now the things are shifting a little bit like there is still definitely maybe a little bit of technical limitation here and there or rigidity that we're still working with mm -hmm. but it's definitely much better than 100 years ago um and i'm i'm there is still yeah there is an issue with the accessibility but also it's much more accessible technically as a field than than before mm -hmm. so how do you see this affecting the the this ongoing um i don't want to say that maybe the ongoing simplification of the arabic letter forms or evolution of it to to keep up with the needs uh, mm -hmm. of, of reading now mm -hmm. uh, I, I find that the last few years are rather um, have seen rather positive developments because of this um, increased accessibility to the tools um, because of the diversification of people who do stuff uh, so and also because more and more people come to that craft with more and more training and one built on on the other and um what we see is just start, uh, the products get better and they get more diverse um it's it's always the story of standing on the giants of others and one one builds on on the achievements of the other so from from my perspective i find that arabic type design especially um has has become more varied in the last 
10 years that there have been more different approaches. Um, and, and I think that some of the, some of the sins of the early digital era are being overcome now, I think, because people are asking more questions and, and they have more material to refer to and um, different approaches emerge. So when in the, in the late 90s or early 2000s, you saw a strong kind of Latinization um, tendency where everything had to be fairly, fairly blocky. Um, and of course, you can still see that in, in corporate design, you can still that, see that in many logos. Um, again, owing, that's owing to the predominant uh, Western design language and um, to having logos in all caps that are awfully difficult to so-called match with, with a script that doesn't have the kind of uh, structure that capitals do. Um, but still, I think um, overall that the diversity is increasing and the quality is, uh, is augmenting. So I'd be, I'd be very optimistic for the, for the future of Arabic type design and, and subsequently of, of, of typography. I, I definitely agree to this. And um, if, if anything that I wish I can see more for is um, maybe the academic study of Arabic script to be present in the in in, in the region uh, or in the hometown of the script itself. While the academy is not definitely the only uh, way to do it or the only source of study and research and everything, but like I think if anything, the, the this is the part that I feel kind of needs a push like mm -hmm. to have more of like research groups uh, research points um for, for yes, and within I, I, the and native sphere these, well also all of this is happening and um, it just also takes time how long how long um you know to, to pursue a, even a phd which is kind of the, the first level of, of original research, yeah? um, that takes a minimum of three years. Uh, and then the publishing process, if you end up publishing, takes another few years on top of that. Um, and unfortunately, not everything that is being researched on the PhD level or at the MA level finds any kind of route into publication. Um, so you need a bit of breath to see it through. Um, yeah. And and I have I very much believe that things are happening also that are not public yet. There are many many design departments throughout the Middle East um, that have been set up only in the last ten to fifteen years, and many of them will be producing things that just are not public yet. Uh, so there is hope that there will be more and uh, useful and productive contributions from, from these places. I, I, I agree on this whole now. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Titus mentioned the practice of matching in recent multi-script typography and type design. Does the new book look at Arabic in the context of multi-script typography historically or only at Arabic uh, itself? Well, that's a good question. Um, yep. That, uh, so in the book, uh, one section that is that I have written that is um, an essay on on what I call the the typography of the Nahda, um, and there I look at how um, in this fifty to sixty year window, Arabic typography from these three centers um, evolved, and for that purpose I have selected a few case studies in which I discuss their typographic choices. And in some cases, they include uh, multiple scripts. And yes, in that context, I, I look at them, I discuss them. And so there is, a, there is a historical component to that. And then in the more practice-oriented part, there are, there are considerations of what to think about when setting Arabic next to another script. Um, so it, is, it features, it's not a prominent 
long discussed subject, but it features in, in, in various sections of that book. Do you feel that the, the, like I personally feel that a little bit, but do you feel that this pressure of, of matchmaking process or a, 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 a specific uh, understanding of presence of Arabic script next to a Latin script is mm -hmm. fading away now than, than 10 years ago? Um, it's, it's, it's a hard call um, um, to generalize. I, I, but what I, what I tried to say before that I think that there is a diversification of approaches um, means that there are different kind, there are different voices and different approaches. And I think more of them are critical of this matching of this expectation that everything needs to conform to the dimensions and the way things in Latin or European typography. Um, I've recently worked for a client from, from Italy, a design agency, and they have done the, they've been asked to do an Arabic version of a logo. And what they started out with and what they had done previously um, for another client was exactly, it fell exactly into this mold of, um, that you see throughout the Gulf, yeah, the, the, the Arabic logos that don't look anything like Arabic script and just uh, copy paste, uh, turn around versions of, of, of the Latin logos. But so this client was, conscious that what they had done previously maybe was not top and that they should seek help and they approached me and they were very very open to my suggestions and we ended up producing something that i think is an authentic arabic script logo that still matches the latin without adopting its its peculiar characteristics so if just by this example, I can extrapolate. I think, yes, the expectation that Arabic needs to look like Latin is, is crumbling. And I, I, I hope it is. And I hope the work of us and, and everyone who, who approaches the subject with, let's say, with a sensibility to Arabic as a distinct uniquely um, unique writing system well helps this process and makes it makes the assumption crumble even faster sure. uh, we are welcoming if if anyone asks okay we have two more questions uh, speaking about accessibility and academic text i understand that as a researcher knowledge work is paid work and perhaps we cannot expect the knowledge work to be free as this is what perpetuates severely the lapidates and underfounded knowledge economy question one however is there a way for the knowledge work to be funded uh, funded to be uh, open source as opposed to be highly priced knowledge object. Uh, example like Google Fonts uh, of research. Okay. Also, is the is it worth writing and publishing micro histories, or does the length of such an article rather the lack of it undervalue the rigor and depth of larger project? Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah, as I, as I said earlier, I think there are there are the the open access. Um, I don't know if movement is the right word, but there is a uh, a strong trend to turn research outputs into open access uh, by default. That's that you can find throughout universities. You can find that um, with the with the big funding bodies. So there is definitely a, a development in in the right direction. The publication of a book, um, I think you have to keep in mind that it is costly. And um, the more specialized your subject gets, the less potential purchases you will have for your book. And so there, there is, of course, uh, a question of, of economy there. Uh, you cannot just produce 
books on top of, of the research um, and just assume that the bills will be paid somehow. Um, so yes, there is, there is a very tangible economic aspect to it. Um, also, it's not as if, as if researchers were exactly the, the most well-paid individuals on earth that um, make a killing f through their work. Usually they, they are in a rather uh, precarious situation, especially the younger generation of researchers that, are, that may not even have uh, permanent contracts, but just work from one short-term project or mid-term project to the next. Um, so I cannot give you a, a, a solid solution to all of these issues, but I think I would be, I'd be reluctant to have such a, um, yeah, um, almost antagonistic perspective on, on research being also something that costs because the money needs to be coming from somewhere. Um, and yes, if it's public money, it should be published in open access. And as I said, that's very much what is happening. Um, and uh, what was the second question? Uh, is it worth writing and publishing micro histories? Uh, worth from what perspective? Um, yes, from anything, any, any additional um, information, any, any, any contribution to knowledge is worthwhile. Um, is it worth your time? Can you still pay the bills? Um, do you have to compromise your paid work in order to do research? Um, when, when, I, when I finalized my, my book, uh, the, the Arabic typesetting in the machine age book, uh, I had a one and a half year old son. I was the only breadwinner in our family. I had no employment, but I was a self-employed type designer. Uh, and I forfeited the fee that I would have got from, from Brill for typesetting the book in order for it to be published in, in full color and to be well bound. So I don't know, um, you, you, you make decisions and you, you try to contribute as best as you can, but it's all within the framework of what you can do at the given moment. Yeah, it's it's very important to highlight that. Yeah, it's it's definitely not the responsibility of like this. This issue of accessibility is not the responsibility of the researcher, and it's much bigger. Like it's it's a systematic issue that that we are living, that is definitely not the researcher to be uh, responsible for, but rather more of like the whole capitalist. Uh, way education and, and information trading is is being dealt with uh, yeah is and, and, and I'm, failing I'm, us yeah i'm not i'm not sitting here to to defend the pricing models of academic publishers that's not that is not my my intention by no means <laughs> um do we have any further question because we've been talking for an hour and I'm very thankful for your for your time and for your inputs today. Um, well, thank you, thank you again for for having me. I've, it's been it's been really um, interesting to to have this conversation. Oh, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, I look forward for the announcement of of the release in the autumn. I would love to to get to meet you and Honor and everyone else. Okay, we have one more question. Excellent. Uh, echoing what Tilas is saying from an Abu Dhabi perspective, indeed, the practice of Arabic logo design in order to create a match to a Latin counterpart has changed enormously in the last decade. The average practice is still questionable, but many instances of original and innovative approaches are emerging. I uh, see Goffredo. Ciao, Goffredo. Um, yeah, well, that's that's very positive to hear, and um, I'm glad I'm glad that my my impression is is also echoed is echoed from 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 the perspective in Abu Dhabi. That's excellent to hear. Yeah, and and one thing actually to add to this in my own experience, um, 
I was telling you before we, we went live that I was working on this project with Google and in the discussion with the consultant, it opened the discussion about what is contemporary, if this approach is contemporary or like our mm -hmm. approach to design is contemporary enough or not. Uh, one of the very interesting findings that I came across is that we uh, we were able to do some kind of uh, reach out to various designers, uh, various users and readers mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. the region from uh, Dubai to uh, Algeria. And after asking over 200 uh, users, uh, making them choose between three different approach, like three different designs for a word in Arabic. One of them is the formerly, uh, formerly uh, labeled as Dubai font, that like mm -hmm. super Latinized version. One of them is like extremely authentic, like very traditional, like a traditional Arab, like the, I think it was the Amiri uh, mm -hmm. font, like a very traditional Arabic. And the third was something that is like a monolinearish Arabic that is like still proper Arabic, but more of on a simplified version. Yeah. And surprisingly, actually, people were more voting towards the 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 little bit simplified and the Amiri over the Latinized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they labeled that as readable, more modern to them, and okay. more authentic. Okay. And if anything, I think like this whole movement, it was more led by designers that either affected by Latin grids or by a Latin taste or Western taste, mm -hmm. rather than actual use, like actual readers. In my opinion, I think always preferred the more traditional approach to to the arabic or the more authentic one and and well yeah maybe one can also just uh, distinguish between um type and typography that is done for continuous reading for long text where you have uh, what you just described some uh, a tendency not to favor uh, anything too modular um and uh, the other stream you find more in in logo design and in applications where um, some kind of perceived homogeneity of brand message is more important than um, being able to distinguish the individual letter forms. Uh, so, and possibly there's room for both. I'm, I'm not saying it's everything needs to look in a, in a specific way. Uh, but I think what is, what is key is that all of these decisions are well reflected and, and critically um, considered because often one gets the impression that, and that is certainly the case that in, in practice, just many things get copied and imitated without asking in the first place, why was something designed in a specific way? And, and I think there, that's, that is exactly where research ideally with the original sources comes in, where it can make a real difference in in unearthing and describing what were the, the trajectories, the, 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 the path that led to a certain design. And, and if we are able to, to open up more archives and, and more correspondence, which is fabulous to, to have if you're, if, you're, if you're researching how something emerged, how something evolved, then yeah, then we can tell more and more insightful stories that give people a chance to evaluate on their own why things look a certain way. And if, you, if you're in a position to ask why something looks in a certain way, you also are in the very enlightening position to be able to say, well, if it didn't need to look in that particular way, it could also look different. And, and that's what gives you options and opportunities to design differently and and potentially better. Yeah, that's that's actually one beautiful note now to, to end our conversation on. Um, I'd really love to thank you so much uh, for your time today and for all the great work you do. Thank you. And thank you very much yeah, for inviting me. I'll definitely me in for be looking this. forward to the, to the publish of your project. Thank you. And uh, thanks to all the questions from the from the audience and um, yeah, thanks for having me and thanks for running this show because I think that by itself is a fantastic contribution.
Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.